buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy. How can you truly enjoy the meal, unless you know the flavor? Ah, uh, welcome back, ABL fans. This is Big Earl, your trusted voice in action baseball league analysis, coming at you with our fifth installment of Deep Dive 25. Strap in, because we're about to slice, dice, and dissect all the nuances of this great league. A heartfelt tip of the cap to the seasoned Cincinnati Inquirer beat writer for crafting an in-depth, nuts and bolts breakdown of the team's inner workings. Your love for the game and the ABL shines through in every word. Okay. ABL fanatics, let's do this. Whether it's the Central Workhorses, the Western Wildcards, or the Eastern Powerhouses, we're covering it all. Ah, baseball aficionados, fasten your seatbelts and keep your eyes peeled. We're diving deep into the Cincinnati Cougars, the ABC Central Division's formidable force at the plate, backed by a pitching lineup that's still ironing out the kinks. If you're one of those folks who can't get enough of the nitty-gritty, the ins and outs, the ups and downs of ABL baseball, then this deep dive is for you. It's like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You never know what treasure you're gonna find. Ah, so pop open a can of ski soda, and perhaps settle in with a hearty bowl of Cincinnati chili as we get ready to delve into a team as multifaceted and rich in character as the Queen City's storied riverbanks. Question 1. How does the owner's personality and negotiation style influence the team's culture and performance? The complexity of command, Jihu Ju's dual nature, and the Cincinnati Cougars' playoff ambitions. Ah, the Cincinnati Cougars, an ensemble of talent and drive. But let's cut to the chase. The real story here is the man up top, owner Ji Woo Ju. He's a character study and contrasts folks. A personable guy, Ju fosters a clubhouse that's more like a family reunion than a corporate meeting. Players don't just punch the clock, they buy into a community, making that extra hustle in the ninth inning feel like second nature. Yet, when it comes to negotiations, Ju's as controlling and temperamental as they come, a fastball pitcher disguised as a knuckleballer. He's willing to spar in the bargaining room, making him an enigma that both attracts and repels talent. But don't mistake his play 500 ball mantra for lack of ambition. That's a smoke screen. The real aim? Championship glory by 82. This dichotomy between Ju's congenial personality and his hard-nosed business acumen creates a tension within the Cougars that's palpable, from the front office to the dugout. It's a tantalizing mix of comfort and challenge that has this team poised for not just a playoff run, but potentially a deep one. So, Cincinnati fans, sit tight. Your Cougars are a multi-layered beast, and this season promises to be a revealing one. Question 2. What roles do the front office and coaches play in the team's success or struggles? Are they aligned with the owner's vision? The aligned ambition, front office and coaches as the engine of the Cincinnati Cougars playoff train. Listen up, ABL fans, especially you Cincinnati diehards. Ever wonder who's making the Cougars purr? It's a well-oiled machine from the top-down folks. Owner Ji Woo Ju's got his vision for a championship by 82, and he's got the right men in the war room and the dugout to make it happen. General Manager Phil Trammell is as outstanding as they come, a man who's got the strategic acumen of a chess master and is perfectly aligned with Ju's long-game ambitions. Expect him to move some pieces around the board before the season's out. On the bench, hitting coach Jared Teitelbaum brings outstanding expertise and a focus on patience and hitting, complementing the owner's vision like a fine wine with a steak. Then you've got bench coaches Dante Johnson and Joe Teague, a balanced pair, embodying temperamental and personable traits, ensuring the clubhouse atmosphere aligns with the owners. The bottom line? This front office and coaching staff are not just cogs, they're the engine to Ji Woo Ju's high-octane sports car, driving toward a destination that could well be a championship podium. Keep an eye on the moves they make, they'll be the prologue to whatever playoff drama unfolds. Question 3. How does the team's financial health reflect in its performance? Money in the bank, but wins on the field, the Cougars' financial health versus performance. The Cincinnati Cougars are a financial puzzle, ranked 6th in lead payroll at $10,507,500 and just barely in the black with total revenue of $10,954,517. The revenue breakdown shows contrasts. Their modest gate revenue is puzzling, given a season ticket haul of nearly $5 million and a lucrative $5.3 million media deal. The Cougars also have a sizable $3,630,113 in cash for potential trades. 
Fan interest is sky high, ranked third in the league at a perfect 100. But the team's early 1981 performance doesn't seem to justify the financial outlay or fan fervor. With a nearly full stadium boasting 96.1% capacity, they've got the backing they need. The question remains, are they converting this robust financial health and fan loyalty into on-field success? So far, the answer is murky at best. The Cougars have the resources to dominate, but the win-loss columns aren't reflecting that, yet. Question 4. How has fan interest evolved over time, and what does it mean for the team's revenue and player acquisitions? Fan fervor and financial frustration, the Cougars' untapped potential. In the ABL, few can match the Cincinnati Cougars' level of fan loyalty, a consistent score hovering near 100, year over year. Yet, this fervor is a double-edged sword. On the revenue side, they've got a near-packed stadium with 96.1% capacity and a media deal that's worth its weight in gold at $5.3 million. But then there's the merchandise revenue, a lackluster $153,090, a number that doesn't jive with the fan metrics. On the player acquisition front, the Cougars' Arden fan base should be a magnet for top-tier talent, especially with $3.6 million in trade cash. But here's the kicker, with a payroll already at $10.5 million, they need to start seeing ROI in the form of wins and, dare I say, championships. High fan interest breeds high expectations. The Cougars are sitting on a goldmine of fan enthusiasm, they've got the resources, both human and financial. Now, they need to turn these assets into on-field success, otherwise, they risk turning a fervent fan base into a fickle one, and in baseball, that's a spiral you don't want to get caught in. Question 5. What is the current mood among the fan base, and how could it impact the team in the short term? The euphoric edge, Cincinnati Cougars fan base, and the ticking clock of expectations. The Cincinnati Cougars are surfing a tidal wave of fan loyalty, marked by a league third best fan interest score of 100 for the 1981 season. But don't be fooled, this is no blind devotion. It's an optimistic but anxious crowd, a collective psyche that's impatient for success and downright starved for October baseball. This fervor is a double-edged sword. On one side, it can pad gate revenues and potentially revamp those dismal merchandise numbers. It also serves as a morale-boosting tenth man for the players on the field and a magnetic pull for new talent. On the flip side, it ratchets up the scrutiny on the front office, where every decision becomes a potential tipping point in the court of public opinion. The Cougars are walking a tightrope of sky-high expectations, and while it may boost them in the short term, anything less than playoff glory could start showing cracks in this love affair. Time is of the essence, and the Cougars better start delivering, lest they turn this euphoria into disillusionment. Question 6. How is the team faring in the league standings, and what factors are contributing to their performance? The Cougar Conundrum, a tale of home comforts and road woes. Sitting just a smidge below 500 with a 9-10 record, the Cincinnati Cougars are a perplexing study in contrasts. Their home record, an impressive 7-3, paints them as masters of their domain, underscored by a run differential of plus 15. Ah, but hit the road, and it's like they're playing in quicksand, a dismal 2-7 away record. It's as if the comforts of home are a necessity, not a luxury. Add to that a lackluster 2-3 record in one-run games, and you've got a team that's faltering in the clutch moments that often define a season. Their strength of schedule at 0.54 suggests they're not just padding stats against the league's bottom feeders, they're in the thick of it, facing worthy opponents. With a two-game winning streak and a pivotal series against St. Louis on the horizon, the Cougars have a chance to correct course. But let's be clear, they need to get their act together, particularly on the road, if they aim to be more than just a middle-of-the-pack contender. Time to decide what kind of team they want to be. Question 7. What are the team's odds of making the playoffs on a divisional and conference level? Playoff Roulette, the Cincinnati Cougars balancing act for October glory. Ah, playoffs, the promised land. For the Cincinnati Cougars, the numbers are tantalizing but not definitive. In the divisional hunt, they sit at a 28.1% chance of grabbing that ABC Central title, a number that's more hopeful than hapless. Zoom out to the conference panorama, and they teeter at a 41.6% chance of making the postseason dance. It's a coin flip, folks. Now, let's talk muscle and sinew, the war numbers. Their batter war is a sturdy 5.11, but ah, uh, the pitcher war, a frail 1.49. If these Cougars aim to prowl deep into October, those arms better turn from noodles to steel. They're riding a two-game win wave with a critical series against St. Louis looming. This could be their pivot point. 
The Cougars are a steady and imbalanced, potent bats, faltering arms. If they find that equilibrium, watch out. The postseason isn't just a possibility, it could be their stage. Question 8. How do base runs and ELO ratings paint a picture of the team's true strengths and weaknesses? The Cougars' ELO and base runs, a tale of unmet expectations and glimmers of hope. The Cincinnati Cougars' performance this season is a mixed bag, as evidenced by their base runs and ELO ratings. Their offensive struggles are clear. They've scored only 99 runs, falling short of the expected 104 runs, a gap that underscores their missed opportunities. Conversely, their defense has shown resilience, conceding only 84 runs compared to an expected 87, a modest but promising overachievement. However, these nuanced performances haven't translated into wins. Their actual win percentage stands at a disappointing .474, a far cry from the projected .577. The ELO rating, a measure of team strength that takes into account all facets of the game, compounds this narrative. Starting the season at 1,526.8, the Cougars have seen a slight dip to 1,526.0. More concerning is the 30-day downward trend of minus 27.6, although a 7-day positive swing of plus 8.4 offers a glimmer of hope. In sum, the Cougars are a puzzle, defensively sound but offensively wanting, and a team whose potential greatness is yet to fully materialize on the field. Question 9. What does the team's war indicate about its most valuable players? The War Report, Cincinnati Cougars' Offensive Prowess and Pitching Paradox. Ah, the tale of the tape is told by war. For the Cincinnati Cougars, their batter war of 5.11 is a neon sign flashing offensive juggernaut. These aren't just guys swinging lumber, they're artisans crafting run-scoring masterpieces. But hold your horses, the pitcher war is a paltry 1.49, suggesting the mound might as well have a revolving door for all its inconsistency. It's like having a luxury car with a shaky engine, you can't trust it for the long haul. The overall team war sits at a respectable 6.6, .6, but their wins minus war of 2.4 indicates they're not fully capitalizing on their talent. It's like leaving money on the table but in the form of wins. Simply put, if this team wants to roar into the playoffs, the pitchers need to match the headline-grabbing feats of the hitters. Until then, the Cougars remain a thrilling enigma in the ABL landscape. Question 10. How have injuries impacted the team's performance and depth? Injuries and depth, a complicated landscape for the Cincinnati Cougars. So far, the Cincinnati Cougars have faced a trifecta of injuries that have cost them 63 days on the disabled list and $73.6 thousand dollars from their pocketbook. While the financial hit is a mere blip on the radar, the real concern is the depth of the bench and how it impacts on-field performance. The DL days aren't just numbers, they reflect a ripple effect that alters the dynamics of lineups and pitching rotations. More than just physical setbacks, these injuries pose a psychological hurdle, heightening the pressure on remaining players to fill the void, sometimes to their own detriment. It's a challenge for the front office and coaching staff, who must adapt on the fly, making judicious use of their bench and possibly shopping for short-term replacements. In essence, these injuries present both an obstacle and a litmus test for the Cougars' resilience and strategic adaptability. Question 11. What do the team's batting statistics reveal about its offensive capabilities? The balanced bats of the Cincinnati Cougars, a statistical deep dive. Ah, the Cincinnati Cougars are wielding some balanced lumber folks boasting a hefty .287 batting average and an on-base percentage that would make Moneyball aficionado swoon at .374. These guys are a pitcher's conundrum. They've got a respectable 17 home runs, showing they've got pop but aren't exactly Ruthian in their power. Their slugging percentage at .455 and isolated power at .168 underline their ability to rack up extra bases, but don't expect fireworks every at-bat. The strikeout percentage sits at a disciplined 15.3%, and their walk percentage at 10.11% shows there are no pushovers in the box. They've scored 99 runs, so they're not just getting on base, they're coming home for dinner. Add in a weighted on-base average of .378 and a bobbip of .324, and you've got a team that's neither lucky nor unlucky, just darn good. Pitchers, be warned, this is a lineup that can beat you in multiple ways. Question 12. How does the pitching staff stack up against divisional and conference competition? The middle of the road menace, Cincinnati Cougars pitching staff analyzed. If you're looking for a roller coaster ride, Cincinnati Cougars pitching staff isn't your thrill. With an ERA and FIP nestled at 4.54 and 4.63, respectively, they're the definition of middle of the road, neither a liability nor an asset. 
Their XFIP of 4.53 suggests they're not underperforming. They're just not overachieving either. A strikeout percentage of 15.3% hints at the need for more oomph in their pitches, and a walk rate of 9.12% raises a few eyebrows on the command front. They managed to induce a solid 51.4% ground ball rate, which is a saving grace, but a 9.1% HR slash FB ratio tells us they're not overly generous with the long ball. Batters are hitting .261 against them, and they're letting too many on base with an opponent OBP of .349. A law percent of 73.1% shows they can work out of a jam now and then. Summing it up, this staff is serviceable but unspectacular. If the Cougars aim to claw past their divisional and conference competitors, they'll need more than a middle-of-the-pack performance from their mound men. Question 13. Are the team's fielding statistics a strength or a weakness? A work in progress, unpacking the Cincinnati Cougars fielding metrics. The Cincinnati Cougars fielding story reads like a suspense novel, full of highs and lows. Their zone rating, ZR, paints a portrait of a team that's as inconsistent as it is intriguing. While the infield shines, particularly at second, third, and shortstop, first base and right field are concerning with negative ZRs of minus 0.93 and minus 1.79, respectively. The pitcher's spot also raises an eyebrow with a minus 1.55 ZR. On the flip side, the defensive efficiency of 0.707 and a low error count suggest a team that's not prone to shooting itself in the foot. But let's not forget the 15 double plays turned and a decent outfield arm, factors that add a layer of reliability. The base stealing stats are a mixed bag, though, with a thrown out percentage of just 23.08%. So, what's the final word? The Cougars fielding is neither their Achilles heel nor their secret weapon, it's a work in progress, a blend of promise and pitfalls. If they can plug those glaring holes, they might just elevate their fielding from serviceable to stellar. Until then, it remains a neutral factor in their championship quest. Question 14. What do base running stats say about the team's tactical approach? A conservative approach, unraveling the Cincinnati Cougars' base running tactics. The Cincinnati Cougars are the antithesis of a high-risk, high-reward team when it comes to base running. With only four stolen bases against five caught stealing instances, their 44.4% success rate is languishing well below the league average. Add a negative WSB of minus 0.66 to the mix, and it's clear that their base running tactics have been more of a hindrance than a help. Despite generating ample opportunities with 117 singles, 76 walks, and 17 hit by pitches, the Cougars are reluctant to turn these into stolen bases or extra bases taken. Even their sole intentional walk reveals that opponents don't view them as a base running threat. In essence, the Cougars' conservative approach on the base paths is a calculated decision, one that aligns with their broader offensive strategy of relying on timely hits over aggressive base running. Whether this tactic is a winning formula remains to be seen, but for now, it's their chosen path. Question 15. Who are the standout performers in batting, and what do their stats reveal? The luminaries of the lumber, Cincinnati Cougars batting standouts. The Cincinnati Cougars boast a veritable murderer's row of hitters that blends youthful exuberance with seasoned expertise. At just 25, Esteban Martinez is the wunderkind of the lineup, boasting four home runs, a .338 average, and an eye-popping .433 WOBA. Not to be outdone, the savvy veteran Tony Jones, 31, is turning back the clock with a .318 average and a team-leading 0.80 war. Mid-career players Pablo Lorero and Patricio Cogombrero, both 27, round out the core. Lorero's .281 average and .394 WOBA signify his all-around contributions, highlighted by a 0.72 war. Cogombrero, with a .301 average and .391 WOBA, adds another layer of offensive potency, albeit with a more modest 0.26 war. Together, these hitters form a multi-dimensional offensive force that should give opposing pitchers many a sleepless night. Question 16. Who are the key figures in the pitching staff, and how do they influence games? The men on the mound, key pitchers in the Cougars staff. The Cincinnati Cougars pitching staff is a tale of two generations. Alex Perez, a burgeoning 26-year-old, leads the rotation with a 3-1 record and a respectable 4.00 ERA, yet his modest 5.50K-9 suggests he's not overpowering hitters. The veteran Rick Satchel, 32, mirrors Perez with a solid 0.44 war and a 2-2 record, but his 4.62K-9 raises eyebrows. Both could stand to miss more bats. 
Then there's another 26-year-old, Gil Medina, who brings promise with his higher 7.30K-9, but struggles with a 1-2 record and a 4.696 ERA. Overall, the Cougars staff is competent, but not awe-inspiring. They're the kind of arms that keep you in games, but they're not shutting the door with authority. For a team eyeing the postseason, the question looms large, can these pitchers elevate their game when it counts? Question 17, who excels in base running and fielding, and how do they impact the game's outcome? The understated aces, base running and fielding impact players for the Cougars. In a game where the spotlight often shines on the long ball and the strikeout, let's not forget the players who make their mark in the shadows of the diamond. For the Cincinnati Cougars, Lance Lind is the lone wolf on the base paths with a perfect stolen base record and a positive WSB of 0.243, subtly shifting the game's momentum. On the flip side, the leather is where Victor Torres and Joe Rogers shine. Torres, in left field, is nothing short of a human vacuum, boasting a ZR of 1.691 and a flawless fielding percentage. Then you've got Rogers at third base, the elder statesman who commands the hot corner with a ZR of 1.265 and a knack for crucial plays. Don't overlook Lin's fielding prowess either, he's pulling double duty with a perfect fielding percentage and a commendable ZR of 0.885 at shortstop. In baseball, it's these small, often overlooked contributions that can tip the scales, and these men are masters of the understated art of winning ball games. Question 18. What does the team's age demographic reveal about its experience and future potential? The Cougars' age demographic, a delicate balance between now and the future. Here's the tale of the tape for the Cincinnati Cougars folks. Their age demographics reveal a team standing at the crossroads of immediacy and longevity. At the major league level, with an average age of 30.34 years, the team screams win now. This narrative holds true even at AAA, where the average age hovers around 29.44 years, signaling a backup brigade that season rather than spry. But don't ink the Cougars as just a bunch of old-timers, the lower echelons show promise. The AA average age of 25.64, particularly the younger batters, implies some emerging talent that could soon be big league ready. And the single-A squad, averaging 22.89 years, serves as the fountain of youth for the franchise. It's a calculated balance, one that courts immediate success while not entirely mortgaging the future. In baseball, that's as tricky as a knuckleball, and the Cougars seem intent on catching it just right. Question 19. Who has had the best batting and pitching games, and what do these performances signify for the team? Highlight performances, a glimpse into the Cougars' X-Factors. Mark these names and dates, folks. Tony Jones on April 6th and Rick Satchel on April 8th, both against Boston. Jones exploded at the plate with a game score of 53, racking up three hits and three RBIs in a four at bat performance, adding a walk for good measure. Two days later, Satchel delivered a complete game masterpiece, with a game score of 76, allowing just two runs and five hits over nine innings. Zero walks and four Ks rounded out his stat line. These aren't mere numbers, they're a pulse check on the Cougars' potential. They tell us the team has potent game changers. In Jones, they have an offensive catalyst, and in Satchel, a mound maestro capable of going the distance. Performances like these don't just fill the stat sheet, they fuel championship aspirations. If this duo can replicate these standout games, the Cougars won't just be contenders, they'll be a full-blown menace to the rest of the league. Question 20. What does your gut tell you about this team in the 1981 championship season and the Grand Tournament of Champions? Gut check. The Cincinnati Cougars 1981 season and tournament prospects. Ah, uh, the Cincinnati Cougars in 1981. What a tantalizing enigma. Here's a team simmering with potential, teetering on the brink of boiling over into greatness. They're seasoned but spry, competent but not yet compelling. Sure, they've got Tony Jones and Rick Satchel, men who can change the game with a swing or a pitch. But when we roll into the Grand Tournament of Champions, the question lingers, do they have that postseason X factor? That clutch gene? My gut says they're a high wire act without a safety net, a team that could dazzle or tumble, leaving fans either breathless or gasping. They're the sort of squad nobody wants to draw in the first round, but everyone secretly believes they can handle. Sometimes, though, being underestimated is the sharpest arrow in a team's quiver. So, get ready for a season and a tournament that promise thrills, chills, and more than a few nail-biting moments. These Cougars are a wild card in every sense, and that's what makes them so darn intriguing. Question 21. What is the team's history in the Grand Tournament of Champions? 
A storied rivalry and unfulfilled promise, Cougars G2C history. Ah, uh, the story of the Cincinnati Cougars in the Grand Tournament of Champions is a saga filled with near misses and coulda bins. With four trips to the tourney under their belt, they've run into a brick wall each time, named the Houston Mavericks. You see it too, don't ya? Houston's got him on speed dial. The Cougars' peak moment remains 1977, where they advanced past the Divisional Championship Series, only to hit a Houston wall. The added 1979 and 80 data just amplifies this narrative. They're consistent enough to make appearances, but lack the lethal finishing touch. They're not a tournament mainstay, but they're also not strangers to postseason lights. What they've consistently missed is that elusive spark, that magic ingredient to get them over the hump. While nightmares of Mavericks may be keeping Cougars up at night, the question looms large. Can they rewrite this script, or are we in for another episode of the same tragic comedy? Question 22. What is the team's history in previous seasons? From mediocrity to potential, charting the Cougars' evolution, the Cincinnati Cougars, in their journey since 1972, have been a study in incremental progress and missed opportunities. The early years, 72 to 75, were marked by underwhelming performances and lukewarm fan engagement. However, a shift began in 76, marking a period of rising fortunes that included four Grand Tournament of Champions appearances, 76, 77, 79, 80, and a steady climb in attendance and payroll. Their statistical landscape also evolved, with batting averages and ERAs stabilizing to competitive levels. Despite a sluggish start to the current 1981 season, their financial health is robust, boasting a balance of over $9 million. Their cumulative win-loss record stands at 770 to 707, encapsulating a journey of competitive yet non-dominant performances. While their attendance and payroll have seen moderate increases, they've yet to translate that into championship hardware. The narrative is clear. The Cougars have grown into contenders, but the question remains, when will they become champions? But, no report about the annals of Cincinnati Cougars history is complete, without mentioning the name, Scott Reese. A prodigious talent drafted third overall in the inaugural 1972 draft, Reese has been the epitome of excellence, clinching the American Conference Danny Rodriguez MVP award and eye-popping five times, including the last four in a row. Decorated with numerous All-Star selections and Batter of the Month awards, this outfield wizard has also claimed the Toby Hera Clutch Award a staggering nine times, and yes, that's right, there have only been nine given out, affirming his reputation as the linchpin in high-stakes situations. Let's not forget the golden glove he snatched in 79, underscoring his all-around brilliance on the diamond. Despite occasional setbacks from injuries, Reese bounced back stronger, as evidenced by his 5-4-5 game against the Portland Lumberjacks in 1980. Commanding an $8.64 million contract extension, he's not just another player, he's an institution. As the 1981 season unfolds, one thing is clear, Scott Reese is not merely playing the game, he's defining it. And Cincinnati wouldn't have it any other way. The dream of another MVP season and a title run is what the faithful pay to see. Question 23, what's your take on last season? A year of promise and pitfalls, the 1980 Cincinnati Cougars. The 1980 season for the Cincinnati Cougars was a tantalizing mix of near triumphs and glaring omissions. With a head-turning record of 97-65 and a winning percentage of .599, they were the darlings of the regular season but came up short in the Grand Tournament of Champions. While their offense clicked with a .256 average, the pitching staff also pulled its weight, posting a commendable 3.38 ERA. The team slightly outperformed their expected 95-67 record, a cautionary tale about the fine line between success and overachievement. A high attendance of around 1.7 million and a hearty payroll north of $10 million reflected both fan enthusiasm and front office commitment. However, despite the accolades and the numbers, they failed to capture the championship, making the season a complex mosaic of promise, achievement, and ultimately, unfulfilled aspirations. Question 24. How does what happened in the 1980 season reflect on the 1981 early campaign? The echo of 1980 and the dawn of 1981, a tale of two seasons for the Cincinnati Cougars. The 1981 season for the Cincinnati Cougars is laboring under the weighty expectations set by their robust 1980 campaign. With a 9-10 start, they're stumbling out of the gate, raising eyebrows and fueling discontent among a fan base that saw a 97-65 record last year. Despite an uptick in batting average to .287, the lack of wins calls into question the team's clutch performance and run generation. 
The pitching staff, once a fortress with a 3.38 ERA in 1980, has sprung leaks, posting a worrisome 4.54 ERA so far. The financial muscle flexed last year with a $10 million plus payroll now seems like a promissory note coming due. It's a season teetering on the edge of promise and disillusionment, each game scrutinized through the lens of last year's near glory. The Cougars find themselves at a crossroads, either leverage last year's success to right the ship or risk becoming a cautionary tale of fleeting success. Question 25. What is your take on the current roster? A snapshot of hope and concern, analyzing the Cincinnati Cougars' 1981 roster. The Cincinnati Cougars' 1981 roster is a blend of promise and apprehension, a microcosm of standout performances, underwhelming stats, and looming injuries. The pitching staff, spearheaded by an exhausted Alex Perez with a 4.00 ERA, feels shaky, especially with Medina and Satchel hovering in the high fours. The bullpen, however, gets a nod for consistency, thanks to Hines and Jones. Offensively, the spotlight shines on catchers and infielders. Jordan Pedroza excels behind the plate with a .333 average. Joe Rogers is a revelation at third base, and Esteban Martinez brings the power at first base. However, Lance Lynn's .188 average could be an Achilles heel. Outfielders Tony Jones and reigning conference MVP Scott Reese offer reliability but have lacked a spark to change games. Injuries to Brian Filotio and others add another layer of uncertainty. Lineups against both right-hand and left-hand pitching reveal a troubling lack of depth or perhaps misplaced faith in underperformers. Despite financial prowess carried over from a standout 1980 season, the team must make judicious choices to enhance this roster. The Cougars find themselves at an inflection point, their season hanging in the balance between fulfilling high expectations and succumbing to glaring vulnerabilities. Well, there you have it. You're up close and personal deep dive into the Cincinnati Cougars. We've dissected their strengths, weaknesses, and everything in between. We've peeked into the owner's suite, dug into the dugout, and even scoped out the fans in the bleachers. And let me tell you, what a ride it's been. Like a well-pitched game, we've covered all the bases. But remember, baseball is a game of unpredictability. Just when you think you've got it figured out, it throws you a curveball. Ah, the Save Cincinnati Cougars, yourself. a ball club that knew how to roar through the regular season, posting a 97-65 record that couldn't be ignored. But when it came to the Grand Tournament of Champions, the growl turned into a whimper. Will they find the missing piece to their championship puzzle, or are we looking at another broken record repeat of regular season bravado without the postseason glory? The Cougars' tale is far from over, and the next chapter promises to be a page-turner. Big Earl here, folks. Keep your eyes peeled for future reports as we navigate through the twists and turns of another gripping ABL season. So, whether you're a diehard Cougars fan or just love the game, the best is yet to come. Until next time, this is the game. See it for yourself. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself.